Hi students and welcome to today's live IELTS class. My name is Adrian and I'm streaming to you from beautiful Victoria here on the west coast of Canada. I hope everybody is looking forward to an excellent weekend, staying strong, healthy and productive. In this class everyone, we are looking at listening sections. Specifically, we will take a look at a part three and part four example listening. We will do the listening, answer the questions, talk strategy, and get a good idea of how to get some better band scores. Welcome to our chat moderator, Carolina. Welcome students, Summit, uh, Seema, Fitbeast, Tushkar. Good to see many, many students in the class. While we wait for a few more of your peers, this lesson is presented to you by aehelp.com for academic IELTS success. Visit us there for the general IELTS. Check us out at g-i-e-l-t-s help.com. That's general IELTS help.com. On both of those websites, we have lots of HD videos uh, to help you improve your communication and your English with strategies uh, for your next IELTS exam. We have original practice tests, fully interactive course. I will use these today. This is the academic IELTS website here. You can click that big red button to join our premium package. It is a one-time payment for lifetime access and we're an IELTS registration center and certified agents. So you are in good hands with us. Uh, General IELTS, it's the green background, gltshelp.com. Click this big red button to join us there. Well worth the small investment to improve your English, your communication and your IELTS scores. Get our apps, link the apps to the websites, get the app Academic IELTS Help from your app store or General IELTS Help from Google Play, Apple Apps. Um, and uh, if you have questions, just send me an email to adrian at aehelp.com. I will gladly answer um, your inquiries. Ah, you're very welcome, Summit. All right. So uh, we have listening right now. Tomorrow we'll have a couple more classes, speaking part two for members, part three for everyone. Um, that's tomorrow. As usual, classes go from Wednesday uh, to Saturday. Um, all right, everyone. So yesterday we did uh, listening part one and part two. Many of you did a fantastic job. I introduced a couple of strategies. One of the strategies that I introduced yesterday was to look at the topic of each of the listening parts. So IELTS listening has four parts. Each one is 10 minutes. Each one deals with a specific topic or subject, okay? Like uh, students discussing a project at school, okay, for example. Um, and uh, yesterday, during the instruction time, we took a sneak peek at the topics of uh, the different parts. Uh, part three was a discussion about uh, trade, maybe something about free trade. And then part four is something about uh, Michelangelo. Okay, so we know that much. So this is just a little bit of a refresher. We will be listening to part three in a moment and then part four. So discussion about trade, uh, trade meaning trade between countries, imports, exports. Um, and then number four, Michelangelo, the famous um, sculptor, artist, uh, architect that lived during uh, the Renaissance, I believe, the 1400s. All right, um, so getting into it, here is the listening. So these are the listening questions. And uh, to kick off the class, we're just going to uh, listen to the audio. We're going to answer these questions while we listen. So in the IELTS exam, this is different from TOEFL. Um, in the IELTS, you answer while you listen. In the TOEFL, you answer after you finish listening. So <clears throat> IELTS, <clears throat> you answer while you listen. 
Uh, and uh, right now I'm going to play the audio for you using my uh, microphone and the speaker. So if it's quiet for you, uh, make sure to turn up the volume. And importantly, students, please don't put your answers in the chat right now. Uh, we can share them after. Give everybody a chance to answer on their own. So uh, let me just uh, hop over to our website here. We're going to jump into our student account. Let me see here. Am I not logged in? Maybe not. Let me log in. Just a moment. Just going to log into my student account here first. I thought I was logged in, but I guess not. Okay, here we go. So now I'm logged into my student account and I can access my audio CDs. And this is uh, test number five, I believe. Yeah, so it's CD five, track three. All right, let's find CD5 track three, and then we shall begin. Perception three. Take some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Listening section three. You will hear a forum discussion between the moderator and two contributors, Dr. Rachel Young and Dr. Ronald Sturgeon, both political scientists at the local university, talking about trade between countries. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. First of all, I'd like to thank Dr. Young and Dr. Sturgeon for taking the time to spend this afternoon with us. Thank you for having us here today. Dr. Young, could you give us a little background on the topic of free trade and protectionism, a little history? Countries and nation states have been participating in free trade schemes for millennia. The ancient Egyptians, for example, participated in trade with the Arabians across the Red Sea over 3,000 years ago. The Roman Empire imported many goods from outside their lands, especially luxury goods such as silk, which were only available in China. Free trade, however, though, has much younger roots. Could you define free trade and protectionism for us, Dr. Sturgeon? Free trade is trade between countries without taxes, tariffs, or other regulations attached. Without a free trade agreement, nations charge taxes or tariffs on goods that are imported to their country. This is to protect the manufacturers within their country. If country A, for example, produces a product for a 20% higher cost than country B, country A is likely to impose a tariff on the importation of country B's cheaper product into country A. This is to level the playing field for domestic manufacturers. Free trade advocates want to take down this barrier, in my opinion, advocates of free trade do not care about domestic manufacturers and workers in their own country. I believe their only intention is to maximize profit for big international businesses. I know Dr. Sturgeon is impassioned about protectionism, but what he fails to mention is that while free trade may lead to some lost jobs in certain sectors, it leads to many other jobs in other sectors. This may be cold comfort to those in, say, manufacturing or textiles, but we must not be blind to the needs of the many and be distracted by the needs of the few. Nobody says free trade between countries is perfect, but it is certainly better than a protectionist framework which costs the country jobs and prosperity. Another point I would like to make is that free trade increases competition and thus lowers the price of many goods. This saves consumers money. 
Purchasing a car, for example, is much cheaper under free trade agreements. While such agreements may appear undesirable for a British company such as Land Rover, since they are given price disadvantage within the United Kingdom, this is not the whole story. While it is true that the company is at a minor disadvantage within their home country, free trade agreements puts them in an equally advantageous position in other countries in which the UK has a free trade agreement. You now have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. to the rest of the discussion and answer questions 27 to 30. This is a very interesting discussion. Dr Sturgeon, from reading some of your work, I know you have some ethical concerns about free trade. Yes, I have a number of ethical concerns. First and foremost, free trade agreements incentivize highly unethical sweatshops. When countries such as the United Kingdom enter free trade agreements with countries with lower human rights standards, we put ourselves at risk of tacitly endorsing those low human rights standards. Is the ability to wear slightly cheaper clothing really worth selling out on one of our most basic beliefs, that people should be treated with respect? I agree with Dr Sturgeon that human rights is an ongoing issue in free trade. Certain incidents, such as sweatshops collapsing and killing dozens of workers, have highlighted this issue in the media and public discourse. But these are isolated incidents. Hardly. These are not isolated at all. And even if such horrible incidents were rare, does it make the conditions those workers work in permissible? Do we excuse horrible working conditions as long as the workers don't die? That's an incredibly low bar, and one I believe we must implore companies and governments to raise. OK, OK, let's move on. Dr Young, do you believe free trade betters the life of the average British citizen? Absolutely. I believe free trade agreements make us more prosperous as a society. While not perfect, I truly believe pursuing free trade agreements is a positive step in making our world a better place. Of course I disagree. While I do not doubt that more wealth comes into our country as a result of free trade agreements, I believe this money never improves the life of the average citizen. The rich get richer and the middle class workers get laid off. Not to mention the ethical issues I have with this. That is the end of section three. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Okay, students, so let's do this together. Let's check our answers together again for any of you that feel it's a little bit quiet just turn up the volume um the other way of course to listen to this uh, in a louder way is to have access to the premium course on the website and listen directly from the website rather than through a series of speakers um all right let me just stop the audio uh, and let's go back and take a closer look at these questions. We've got a few different kinds here. Uh, the first one is uh, fill in the blank. Uh, so here, uh, question 21 is how long ago was the first recorded trade uh, between nations? So how long ago was that? It's at the beginning. Uh, obviously, here you're listening for years. Uh, pay attention to the words that come after the space. It's very likely that you're going to hear this word emphasized. Okay. So Amra says 3,000 in words. Amra, you should always use the number when, whenever you can, not the words, to avoid spelling mistakes. Uh, Mariona or Marjona says, sorry for bad pronunciation of names. Uh, Marjona says 3,000 years ago. Uh, you only need the number here because you have years, right? So, uh, and it's one word. So be really careful. Now, it should say one word or number, okay? 
um, because uh, here just the number is okay. Technically speaking, a number is a word. We say it, right? 3,000. So in this case, uh, the single number is 3,000, okay? So 3,000 years, okay? All right, um, and then we move on uh, to the next questions. 22 to 24 is a bit of a flow chart. Yeah, here we can see no more than two words and or a number. Okay. So when you have this kind of a flow chart, it's a good idea to pay attention uh, to some uh, key uh, words or numbers in the flow chart, like 20% higher because you can uh, guess or infer that the speakers will use this specifically or like country A and country B, okay? A lot of the information is paraphrased between the audio and the questions, meaning that you might not hear the exact same words, but names like country A, country B, and numbers like 20%, you're going to hear that. So you're listening for that, okay? So here, country A produ uh, produces a product for a 20% higher cost than country B. A company in country A imports the product. If the country does not have a free trade agreement, the company must pay a what to import the product? So must pay something. Now, if as long as you understand the information, you can probably guess the answer without even hearing the audio. Um, however, ideally you're putting the same word, okay? So uh, number 22, Amra says is tariff. Uh, Rashika says tariff, David says tax. Yeah, David, tax is okay. The more accurate word is tariff, okay? Uh, tariff is a tax, of course. Uh, ideally, you do want to get the exact word. If you have a perfect synonym like tax, they will likely give you the point, but you should have the word tariff, okay? Uh, this is to level the playing field. Now here, you have the quotation marks, so you know you're going to hear this exact phrase, so listen for it, okay? This is to level the playing field for what or for whom, okay? So did anybody get this one? So this is to level the playing field for, not for profit. So what's number 23? It's a little bit more challenging. Carolina says it's for domestic manufacturers. Yeah, absolutely. So very good, Carolina. Domestic manufacturers. There we go. Whew, two nice long words. Domestic manufacturers. So domestic manufacturers are local producers. So uh, the people who make products within the country. Domestic meaning within the country. It's kind of the opposite of international, if you will. Uh, manufacture, to produce. Manufacturer, those who produce. Manufacturers, plural, for those who produce. Locally, domestically. Okay. Um, part three in your IELTS speaking or sorry, uh, part three in your IELTS listening uh, will be definitely as difficult as what we're doing today, okay? So keep that in mind, all right? This is a very typical um, difficulty level for part three listening. So sometimes, you know, we have students saying, oh, is it really this difficult? Yes, it is, okay? Keep that in mind. All right. So... Uh, keep going with the flow chart. This is connected information, so hopefully you reviewed it well before you heard the audio. 
if the countries do have a free trade agreement, the company does not have to pay to import the item. Some advocates of protectionism, now hopefully we realize here that protectionism is kind of the opposite of free trade. So uh, one system is to have free trade where there's no taxing between the countries. And another way is to have protectionism uh, where uh, you do tax between countries. So some advocates of protectionism believe free trade advocates are only worried about maximizing something for large corporations. Okay, uh, what are we maximizing? Again, you should be able to guess this here. Uh, Marjona says profit, careful with your uh, spelling. Amarjeet says profits, sure. Angel agrees that it's profits. Uh, Rashid says profits. Carolina supports the idea and so does many others. Uh, yeah, so maximizing profit or profits. Now, um, yeah, so in this rare situation, you can have the singular maximizing profit for large corporations or you could have the plural, profit is countable, maximizing profits for large corporations. However, okay, very important however here, most of the time in most situations, only the singular or the plural form of the noun will be accepted and not both, okay? It's very rare that both the plural and the singular make sense or are grammatically accurate. So be very, very, very careful with plurals and singulars. If um, you make a mistake with the plural and singular, uh, they will, of course, uh, count that as a wrong answer. So you have to be really careful. Rare situations, you can get a little bit lucky like here where both profit or profits are acceptable. Okay, so careful. Um, profit Johns is kind of like a benefit, but more accurately, it's a monetary benefit. Okay. So it's a benefit with money. All right. Okay. So everybody's clear on the importance of plural and singular. Of course, one good way to see if it's plural or singular is if there's an article before it, like a or an. So pay attention to the verbs. Pay attention to the articles in the question, okay? Carlos says, crystal clear. Good, Carlos. Carolina, big thumbs up. Good. All right. Um, let's keep going. Ershad, please use English in the chat. Okay, here we go. So uh, 2526, a little bit more fill in the blanks. Uh, no more than three three words and or a number for each answer. Number 25, uh, some people will lose their jobs under free trade agreements, but we must emphasize the needs of the something and not be sidetracked by the needs of the something. So here, you actually need two words for question 25. So in your answer sheet, if you're doing the paper-based exam, you'll have question 25 five and you need to put two words in there to get it correct and the order has to be uh, accurate here okay all right uh, Amarjeet says many and few so we must emphasize the needs of the many yeah and not be sidetracked by the needs of the few. Okay, uh, and be really careful. In the audio, uh, the speaker actually says few first and many second. Um, and I noticed that in the official IELTS exam, they will do that sometimes where they reverse, they flip the order of the two missing words. 
so be really, really careful with that. There's usually one or two questions in the listening and often in the reading as well, where you have two words like this, like many and few, but in the audio they say few first and then many after. The order matters here, so you have to have many first and then few second uh, in your answer key. If you have it opposite, you'll get it wrong. Okay, so for these kinds of answers, the order does matter. Okay. Uh, Depika, it's not fewer. Okay, uh, it's few. Okay, is the correct word form here, not fewer. All right. So many, comma, few. Okay, uh, free trade lowers the price of many goods because it increases. I thought this one was okay. It wasn't too difficult to get. Uh, and it, as long as you understand a little bit about free trade and what they're talking about, again, you can probably just infer this answer, which means you can make an educated guess to figure that out. Okay. Amarjeet says it's competition. Raghav and Marjona agree that it's competition. Um, it is competition. So if I sell the same ice cream for $2 as my competitor sells for $5, then it's going to increase competition for my competitor to uh, sell ice cream at a cheaper price and maybe an even more delicious ice cream and then that increases competition. So quality uh, and price are improved through competition in free, free trade agreements. That's when it functions well. Okay. All right. Stupendous. Here we go. Uh, so we've got a few more questions left. Uh, this one was a little bit of a chart that we needed to fill in really pay attention to the headings of uh, the chart okay uh, very very important to help you get these answers correct so here we have causes and effects so you're basically listening for this cause effect type of explanation okay all right uh, so write no more than one word for each answer Okay, uh, cause, they enter into a free trade agreement. The effect, they jeopardize human rights standards. Okay, um, and then uh, we have sweatshops collapse. The conditions are highlighted in the something. So the cause is the sweatshops collapsing and the effect or the result is the conditions are highlighted in the Media, that's right, Carolina. Uh, Sydney says media. Rashika and Rashid agree. That's fantastic. Yeah. So media it is. Okay. All right. Um, and then uh, the realization that such incidences are not isolated, okay, it means that they don't just happen here and there, but they do happen more frequently. Implore companies and something to raise the bar. Okay, Amra says governments, that's correct. Uh, Johns says government. That is incorrect. Angel says government. That is incorrect. Uh, Muhammad Said Osturk says governments. That's correct. Okay. So implore companies and governments. Very important S there. Why? Because take a look. Companies has an S as well. So implore plural noun and plural noun to raise the bar. Now, in this case, if you miss the S on governments and you write government, then you'll get it wrong, okay? So it has to be governments with a plural, okay? So implore companies and governments. Pay attention to the plural singular noun beforehand. That will help you decide uh, what the next noun should be, plural or singular, okay? It's so kind of going back to that previous point that I made. 
Okay, so now we've got a couple more questions left. So here we have 29 and 30, and these are obviously multiple choice questions, and they are long ones, right? So choose the correct letters A, B, or C. Uh, now, this is where a lot of students are like, oh, I hate these questions in the listening section. It's so hard to figure out the correct answer in the short time. Yeah, um, if you're trying to read the choices while you're listening and trying to figure out what they're saying at the same time, that's very difficult. Even as a native speaker of English, that's very difficult to do. So it's not the correct strategy. You can't read all of this information and listen at the same time. So what do you do, right? Um, what do I do? Um, so don't read all the answers is what you do, but only read the correct answer. Okay. So, uh, let me make, give you a note on this one here. Okay. So for multiple choice in the listening, Okay, listening section, multiple choice question, uh, strategy. Number one, you must read the question and paraphrase it in the preparation time. Okay. So when the audio says you now have some time to review questions um, 26 to 30, then it's very, very important to read this first question here. What is Dr. Young's main point in advocating for free trade? And in your mind, um, you should immediately uh, imagine or visualize what Dr. Young is going to say for this kind of a question. So when you read this, okay, um, what do you think Dr. Young might say for this question? Okay, so Dr. Young's main point in advocating for free trade. So in my opinion, he might say something like, I think free trade is the best option because. Okay, so I can predict that in the audio, one of the speakers, Dr. Young, is going to say something like, I think free trade is the best because. Okay, so they're advocating main point for free trade. All right. Does that make sense? So now I'm listening for this kind of a sentence and then I'm listening for the answer. Okay. In this case. All right. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay. And then when I hear the answer, then I'll look at the choices uh, and figure out which one is uh, the right answer. Okay. And I realized that he said something like they're not perfect, but they're the best we have um, for improving uh, global welfare. Okay. So the correct answer for this one was B. Okay, so good job, uh, Diana. Good job, Marjona, Carolina. Uh, I like notive. Yeah. So B was the right answer. And again, you have to listen for the answer. You have to think about the question. You have to think about how that question will be expressed in the audio. Okay. So catching the right answer is the trick and not hoping that the right answer will reveal itself. That's not going to work. Okay. For those of you who think you're going to get the right answer by staring at the choices and then hoping to catch a keyword, 
Unfortunately, that's not going to work in part three and part four. Okay, there's too much paraphrasing going on for that to be effective. So same thing here. Um, what is Dr. Sturgeon's main point in advocating for protectionism? So we're listening for Dr. Sturgeon to say something like, well, protectionism is better uh, because, or protectionism is the right choice since it helps too. So anything like that we're listening for. Um, and um, the correct answer there was, he said, well, protectionism uh, basically helps create more equality because free trade concentrates wealth into the hands of a few people. So when we heard that, we realized that free trade agreements are bad because they concentrate wealth in the hands of, a, of an elite few. Okay, so the correct answer there was C. All right, and I can see that many people caught that, which is great. Okay, very good. Nicely done. Okay, everyone, so uh, count up your scores. How did you do uh, out of 10 in part three? So ideally, uh, you are getting a score of, let's say, six or more in part three um, in order to get a band 6.5 or 7, all right? So you want to get at least... 60% of those part three questions correct, hopefully a few more, right? Amra says, I got eight. Amra, that's good. Okay, eight is good for part three. Uh, Muhammad, uh, Saeed, uh, six is good. Okay, so it's not bad, it's good, all right? Marjona says 10, 10 is fantastic. Bishal says, I got three. Uh, Bishal, three is, yeah, it's on the low end, okay? Uh, losing seven marks is basically losing two band scores right away, okay? All right, every three marks that you lose in whatever section, roughly, uh, equals to losing um, a band score. Okay, three to four. All right, everyone, so we got one more part left. We've got part four left. Part four, there are no breaks. You just have to answer all the questions in one swoop. Um, so we're going to get into part four now, Michelangelo. So uh, think about Michelangelo here. Okay, let's see if there's one more place where I can uh, turn up the volume. Yeah, let's try this. Okay, maybe it'll be much louder now. So, um, all right, I turned up one more output volume here. Okay, uh, so uh, we're going to uh, get into part four. Again, I'm going to play uh, through my uh, microphone here. If it's quiet, turn up the volume on your side as well. Uh, use a headset if you can. Don't put the answers into the chat. We'll go through them after uh, together. All right, everyone, here we go with uh, part four. So listen and answer. Jump back. Take here. some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Listening section four. You will hear a university lecture on the famous artist Michelangelo. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good to see you all. As you know, we're having an exam a week from today. Material from today's class will be included on the exam, but material from the final two classes of the week will not be included. I hope this will give you an opportunity to revise enough to perform well on the exam. With that administrative business out of the way, I'd like to begin today's lecture 
on the lesser-known works and endeavors of the famous Italian Renaissance artist Michelangelo. While Michelangelo is best known for his painting of the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, he was also the creator of a number of other highly respected works. Among these are the Pieta, a statue of Mary holding a deceased Jesus, and the statue David, said to be the representative of the perfect male form. But Michelangelo was not just a painter and a sculptor. One of his crowning achievements is St. Peter's Basilica, a project he was lead architect on for the 17 years preceding his death in 1564. While the basilica wasn't completed until 1626, over 60 years after his death, Michelangelo's influence on the structure was immense, as he had laid out many plans for the structure during his lifetime, many of which were faithfully carried out under the reign of future popes and future architects. Michelangelo's fingerprints are all over modern Rome, and especially what is today Vatican City. Not only through his paintings, frescoes, and sculptures, but also through his architectural achievements. In addition to his influence on St. Peter's Basilica, Michelangelo also redesigned the famous Capitolini Hill area of Rome and designed many chapels within the walls of the Vatican. Michelangelo was also tasked with a number of pet projects over the years. These projects were not one that the man himself wanted to undertake, but was compelled to because of monetary considerations or simply loyalty to the Pope. For example, when Pope Julius II ordered him to construct a three times life-size bronze statue of the Pope, Michelangelo had no choice but to accept. The project took up more than two years of his life, and four years after its completion, the work was unceremoniously melted down to construct cannons. Additionally, the conditions under which he was made to work were often sorely substandard. For years, he lived and worked with four other men in a cramped apartment with little to no privacy and no room for his creative juices to flourish. It is interesting to imagine what a genius such as Michelangelo could have accomplished given reign over his own creativity. I personally believe the world is a poor place for him having not been allowed this luxury. However, on the other hand, Perhaps Michelangelo's sometimes tortured life imbued his works of art with something more than just artistic genius. Although Michelangelo is a celebrated figure for his works of art and well-respected for his architectural acumen, his literary works are virtually unknown to the world. He was a virtuoso of Renaissance art, celebrated in his lifetime and venerated centuries after his death, but his writings never made an impact on the society in which he lived, nor in the years since. Michelangelo was an avid writer of poetry and found that poetry was an invaluable escape from the grind of his everyday work life, especially during the year spent arduously painting the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Poetry provided an outlet for his frustrations, fears, beliefs, and desires. Those who want to know the real Michelangelo must go beyond his frescoes and sculptures and dig deep into his personal writings. There, one will find a rather tortured soul harmed by years of physical, political, professional, and personal strife. That is the end of section four. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Okay, everyone, make sure to check your answers in that time. And uh, I'm just going to stop the audio here. We'll go back and then answer the questions together. Usman, I think it was mostly visible or 99.9% .9 visible. All right. Um, so lots of information. Uh, basically, there's no way to read or review all of the information in part four unless you're an extremely fast reader uh, in English. So you just kind of have to go with the flow, listen uh, and really read at the same time. So this is where you have to multitask. That's one of the big challenges of part four is you're listening and reading simultaneously. Okay. All right. Uh, so here we go. Um, the beginning, you just have to match some information. Um, it's either on the exam or not on the exam. So this is a classroom lecture about Michelangelo. Uh, 31, material from the third class of the week. Is it on the exam or is it not on the exam? So what is 31? 
Third class of the week, it's not on the exam. Yeah, the information is too close to the exam date. So logically, this would be the one that's not on the exam. And then uh, material from the current class, so uh, that we're learning right now, is on the exam, okay? So the correct answers are B and A. If you didn't catch that, logic will help you, right? So um, the later class, it's too close to the exam, so information is not on the exam. But this class, which is a little bit further from the exam, students should still learn it, study it, and it will be on the exam. Okay. Let's keep going. So now we have this kind of fill in the spaces. This is a very, very typical part four format. Okay, almost guaranteed your part four is gonna have this exact format uh, where you have to listen, read, and fill in blanks at the same time. It'll be uh, somebody holding a lecture. Here it's about Michelangelo. All right, so other works. Uh, while Michelangelo is perhaps most famous for painting the Sistine Chapel, he is also famous for a number of other highly respected works, including the Pieta and the statue named something thought to symbolize uh, male beauty. Uh, Amarjeet says David, Amra, uh, Leo, Johns, Rashika all agree. And David is correct. Make sure to have a big D. It's a name. Uh, if you write this as a small D, you'll get that wrong. Okay. So be very, very careful. Good. So David with a big D. Big D. Very important. All right, Michelangelo's architectural achievements, uh, far more than just a painter. Michelangelo was also an architect. He was lead architect on St. Peter's Basilica for a number of years until his death in 1564. Amarjeet says it's 17 years. Yeah, and it's two words here, 17 years. Uh, you need the word years because uh, there's no, doesn't make sense without it. So there's no word like years in here. So Peter's Basilica for 17 years until his death. Part four is usually one word or sometimes maximum two words or like a number like this. They usually don't have three because that would be too challenging. Uh, though the structure was not completed until 60 years after his death, his fingerprints are all over the resulting structure because future something and something faithfully carried out his designs. Johns, it's not hopes and architects, but it's popes. And popes is usually written with a capital letter. Popes and architects. Now, if you're not clear on um, uh, what you should do with this word popes, especially this capital P, uh, pay attention to the word in other parts of this uh, part four, and then that will help you to figure out what you need to do, okay? So if you see it in the other parts written with a capital, you know that it should be a capital. If not, then you know it's going to be accepted without it, okay? Oh, we got one more here, 36. Uh, Michelangelo's influence is also apparent around the rest of the city of something, including at the ancient Capitolini Hill site. Okay. Uh, Amarjeet says uh, Rome. Yeah, that's correct. Johns, I don't, I don't think it's... Uh, to the ear doctor that you need to go. <laughs> it's just a matter of reviewing and paying attention. You'll catch it. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, it's the city of Rome. And again, it's the name of a city. So definitely a capital R. Okay. City of Rome. And Sydney, uh, Noronha. Uh, yeah, you can do all capitals. So all big letters, R-O-M-E. Just remember that doing all capitals is a little bit slower. So especially in part four, everyone, if you're writing all capitals like this, uh, just remember that this is a bit slower. It's slower to write in all capitals. So you might want to write it all lowercase 
and then change it all to capitals after. Okay, after you catch all the answers. Okay, servant of the papacy. He was also a loyal servant of the Pope. Ah, there it is. See, so you see the word Pope and you notice how it's capital letter. Um, so pay attention to information that's given to you. That can help you catch some marks. Okay. Mm -hmm. So he was also a loyal servant of the Pope. Sometimes this was important work, though sometimes it was rather pointless. He once built a something of the Pope. There you see again only to see it melted down for canon parts just a few years later. Carolina says it's a bronze statue. It is a bronze statue, Carolina. Okay, a large bronze statue. If you wrote just statue, they might give it to you. A bronze statue is the sure answer. A statue is kind of a risky one. It makes sense, but... Uh, you're, it's risky. All right. Um, so, moreover, the something he had to work in were often substandard, often being forced to live and work in small, cramped places with a number of other men. Uh, number 38, Shirin, is what? You have the number. Uh, Amarjeet says conditions under. Uh, just conditions. Okay. Uh, read the sentence, Amarjeet, with just conditions. It makes sense. Okay. So moreover, the conditions he had to. Conditions under he had to. Well, that's awkward. Okay. So moreover, the conditions he had to work in were often substandard. Okay, so just conditions. Uh, yeah, Miyuma, Vatican for the previous instead of Rome. It's too specific. Michelangelo has works all around Rome, not just the Vatican. Okay, so listen carefully. All right. Let's keep rocking and rolling. Literary works. It is interesting to think what he could have made if he was given the freedom to explore his own uh, what? Explore your... Okay, uh, this is a common collocation, so you might have caught it. Muhammad is Turk says creativity. Amra agrees. Yeah, it was creativity. explore his own creativity while his life may have been difficult some people argue that this difficulty made him a better artist possibly okay uh something was an important way to escape the difficulties of michelangelo's life uh last question number 40 what did michelangelo do to escape some of the difficulties of um his life John says poetry. Uh, Rashid agrees that it's poetry. Just careful, Rashid, with the spelling. P-O-E-T-R-Y, right? Wrong spelling, wrong answer. Okay, so poetry. Poetry was an important way for Michelangelo to escape the difficulties of life. Though his writings never made much of an artistic impact, they do offer a window into his tortured genius. So, Stick to what you know, right? Uh, Michelangelo, incredible artist, incredible architect, maybe not as an amazing poet, um, although I shouldn't knock it. I've never read Michelangelo's poetry. Maybe it's not that bad. And that's it. Uh, count up your marks. Now, students that were in yesterday's class as well, uh, <clears throat> count up your marks from 40. So what did you get? From 40, what was your total? This is called your raw score. Okay. And your raw score can then be converted to your band score. 
and it's scaled. Um, so for lower band scores, you can lose more marks. For higher band scores, you can only lose very, very few marks. Uh, band 9 is 39 or 40 out of 40. Okay. Sydney Noronha says 32 between yesterday and today. Uh, Sydney, one place you can check out your band score is on our website. Uh, so on the website, there's a score calculator on the bottom here okay um, and we can go on that score calculator and type in 32 and then we know that you would get a band uh, 7.5 um, for a score of 32 okay uh, morium says 34 and let's check that out uh, yeah 34 is uh, still a band uh, 7.5 uh, Bishal says 30. Bishal, that would be a band 7. 35, Marjona. Let's see. It's a band 8. So that's the difference between 34 and 35. 34 is 7.5. 35 is a band 8. Okay. All right, everyone. So for lots more listening exercises, six original practice exams, uh, click the big red button to join our premium package. It doesn't cost very much and you get lots and lots of great materials to help you improve for the IELTS test. Um, for general IELTS students, visit this website, gieltshelp.com with the green background. For academic IELTS students, visit uh, this website here uh, with the uh, blue background and you can click that big red button it's a one-time payment for lifetime access so i hope you enjoyed yesterday's and today's listening uh, practice session uh, that's it for today's classes however i will be back tomorrow with speaking part two cue card for members it'll be a new one and a speaking part three um, for the all chat class where everybody can join in uh, to share their answers. I hope to see all of you tomorrow. Eugene, thank you so much for the panda, uh, Mr. Potato Head, and clown face emojis. Um, Marjona, you're very, very welcome. Carolina, I appreciate you moderating the classes as always. That's great. Uh, again, join us on our websites, download our apps, get going to those high band scores. Bye for now. I'm Adrian signing out from Victoria. Much love to all of you wherever you are in this beautiful world. I'll catch you tomorrow. Bye.